Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode, Greco-Indian and Buddhist Art of Gandhara, with Dr. Osman Boparachi. Before we begin our interview, I'd like to let you all know that Dr. Boparachi has generously provided dozens of helpful images to act as a visual aid for several of the points he brings up during his answers. I've combined this into a single guide in PDF form, which will be made available to download on both my website and directly linked in the episode description, just like how I have my transcripts and family trees. There are some amazing examples of Gandharan and even Indo-Greek art that he provides, so I strongly encourage you to check those out. Now, let us return back to the show. Hello everyone, today I have the pleasure of welcoming to the show Dr. Osman Boparachi. Dr. Boparachi is a renowned scholar of South Asian history, archaeology, and numismatics, currently serving as the Emeritus Director of Research of the French National Center for Scientific Research, and has worked as a professor at both University of California, Berkeley, and the Paris-Sorbonne University. The bulk of his research focuses on the history of India from Alexander until the Kushan Empire, and he has dozens of publications on the Greco-Bactrians and the Indo-Greeks, including coin catalogs and a recent work entitled When West Met East, Gandharan Art Revisited. Today he is joined to talk about his work regarding the interactions of Greek and Indian art in both Gandhara and the broader region. First off, let me just say thank you very much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thank you so much, Dick. Would you like to give us a bit about your background and what inspired you to dedicate much of your research to those like the Greco-Bactrians and Indo-Greeks? Yeah, in short, you know, as you know, I was born in Sri Lanka. I did my preliminary studies there and I did Western classical culture for my BA degree, which is the Greek and Roman civilization. So before I came to France, I had the knowledge of Latin and Greek. And then um, when I came to France, I mean, it was another story because it was not, I didn't come on a scholarship. I just saved some money and came here. And luckily I met my teacher, supervisor, Professor Paul Bernard, who just returned from Afghanistan because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So I was there for his first class and then he arranged me a scholarship. So that's the beginning. The reason why I came to France was I was very much interested in uh, Greek archaeology, Greek art, and also the Greek philosophy. So at the beginning, I want to do Greek architecture. So Paul Bernard encouraged me to work on both sides. For the MA degree, I worked on the Kushan architecture. And then we, when it came to MPhil and the PhD, he told me since I knew Greek and Sanskrit that I should work on the Indo-Greek collection in the Cabinet de Medai, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library in Paris. So this is how everything started. So I started following his class and also Professor George Lorider, who was teaching at Ecole Pratique de Institute uh, on Greek coinage. So it was a long story of about seven years where I did my BA honors, MA, MPhil, and the PhD, and later I did my habilitation, which is a high doctorate. So that's the background. So I mainly worked on the collection in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and I got the chance to see all the main collections in the public museums like American Numismatic Society, Smithsonian, British Museum, Ashmolean, and all over the world. So the first book which came out in French was based on all these coins that I have seen. But after that, of course, my life changed because since 1990, I finished my PhD in 1987. But after that, as you know, the hundreds and thousands of coins showed up in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I spent my life looking at these coins. For example, the Mirza Kahod itself had four tons of coins. So that's the beginning there of my, of my studies. The arrival of the Greco-Bactrians into Northwest India certainly is a turning point for cross-cultural exchange. But Greeks and Indians had been in close contact for over a century by that point, with the invasion of Alexander and diplomatic overtures with the Seleucids. Do we see the steady introduction of Greek aesthetics into Indian art prior to the establishment of the Indo-Greek kingdoms, such as in the time of the Mauryan Empire or earlier? Yes, but not earlier. When we talk about Indian art, we have the Indus civilization, which is the 4th, 3rd and 2nd millennium BC. The Mauryan Empire was the beginning of what we call the real Indian art. 
uh, when Alexander uh, uh, defeated uh, Porus and the whole area came under, under the Mauryan Empire later under Chandragupta. At that time, Darius, I mean, those who worked for, for the Achaemenid Empire, they came to India and started working for Chandragupta and later for his grandson, Ashoka. So when, um, there are many examples I can show you. For example, the palmet, the geometrical pattern on glazed brick friezes found in uh, Darius' greatest palace in Susa. This same, same motif can be seen in one of the capitals found in Pataliputra, which was the capital of Chandragupta, Bindusara and Ashoka. There we can see the same stylized palmet pattern and also the real and bead border, which is absolutely Greek starting from the archaic period and also the meander pattern. So it's a combination of both Persian, Achaemenid and Greek. And also, for example, I mean, there is more Persian inspiration during the Mauryan period than Greek. For example, there are these isolated columns surmounted by the bell-shaped motifs. And also the famous one was found in Sarnath. Now it is in the Archaeological Museum of Sarnath, where you can see the capital and the four animals and also the lions looking at four cardinal points. This is quite Persian. Um, and also, for example, a winged lion, and also, I mean, you have half gryphon, wings, lion, and the horns. This type of mythical animals began to appear during the Myron period and also later during the Sunga and the Satavahana period, especially in the great Sanchi Stupa, where on the rear side of the eastern Torana or the gateway, we can see men riding this kind of uh, mythical animals, lions with wings and the horns. And also the uh, double bull capital that normally they were found in uh, Susa and also in uh, Persepolis and other palaces in, uh, in the Persian Empire. And these motifs were taken by the artists of India, especially that we can see them in Bharat Stupa and also very particularly in Sanchi, the great Sanchi Stupa, where the columns are there. And on the top of the capital, we have back-to-back -back lions, bulls, and also gods. So this is somewhat we call the inspiration of the Persians and also a little bit of Greek inspiration, not much. Things started really during the Gandharan period where you have, I think we are going to talk about it direct, that uh, um, the inspiration of the Greek art or Hellenistic art on the Gandharan art. The region of ancient Gandhara holds a unique position for its role in the development of Buddhism, and perhaps its most visually stunning contribution is its sculpture work, often simplified as, whether correctly or otherwise, Greco-Buddhist art. Could you give us a better idea of what time period in art history that this refers to, and what exactly are the features of Gandharan art that makes it so unique? It is a very, very interesting question. I need to give a long answer. The Greeks were there, um, I mean, from the time of Seleucids, especially when Diodotus became the founder of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. These Greeks came, I mean, crossed the Hindukush mountains and came to the Gandhara region during the time of Demetrius. And they were there until around the 10th or 20th of the common era. So, I mean, I mean, the last king who may have ruled in this area in the Gandhara region was straight over the second. After that, the Scythians invaded the area where the Greeks were. After the Scythians and the Parthians, Kushans came in. So, the, during the Kushan period, especially during the time of Kanishka, who was the greatest Kushan empire, what I mean was there was art forms before that. But what we call Buddhist art, where the Buddha is shown anthropomorphically in human figure. This cannot be dated prior to Kanishka, although there were, I mean, some traces of Buddhist art starting from, as I told you earlier, from the Myrian period. The Greco Buddhist art was a term invented by the famous father of Gandharan studies, the French scholar Alfred Fouché. He called it La Greco Buddhist, Greco Buddhist art. I mean, now, of course, we don't call it at the same way, although there are a lot of elements, a lot of motifs borrowed from the Hellenistic time to convey an Indian story, the story of Buddha, or the Gautama Buddha, or the Shakyamuni. I selected a sculpture which is quite interesting. 
where you have preaching Buddha in the middle, seated on a full-blown lotus, held by two elephants and a lion. He's in the what we call the Dharma Chakra Mudra or the preaching attitude. What is interesting is on either side there are two columns. These columns are absolutely Persian, the bell-shaped capitals, and on the top of the capital you have back-to-back -back bulls. And also the Greek inspiration can be seen on the upper part where you have the columns surmounted by Corinthian capitals. We call them pseudo-Corinthian. Sometimes, I mean, there were additions to it. And then on the bottom, uh, I mean, below the seated Buddha, in the middle, we have a couple, Arithya and Panchika. I mean, of course, this, there are Indian connotations and Iranian connotations to it. But if you look at it, especially Panchika, uh, or Daksho later, she is almost depicted as Taiki, the city goddess, holding the horn of Abandus, the cornucopia. And also on either side, we have Atlas. Atlas, instead of holding the universe, they are holding the building. And also on either extremities, there are couples which shows the Dionysian inspiration. They are drinking, old man with young woman. So if you look at the whole sculpture, there are Persian elements and the Greek elements. Now, just to give you an idea, I selected two photographs. One is Mahamaya, the future Buddha's mother, dreaming an elephant entering the womb, an elephant with six tusks. Look at the bed where she is lying down. It is typically a Greek bed. If you compare with some uh, designs that you find in the Hellenistic world, the rendering of the, and also the decoration of the uh, bed is Hellenistic and is Greek. This may be one of the reasons Fouché considered this art as greco buddhist But the important thing is, although the motifs are borrowed from the Hellenistic world, what we see here is an Indian story, the story of the future Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni. Just to compare, to, since you asked me the question about the Hellenistic or the Greek appearance of the Gandharan Nath, there is another, another sculpture which I selected where Mahamaya, Buddha's mother, lying down on a bed, on a Greek bed, and we can see the elephant. She was dreaming that elephant entered the womb. On the left-hand side, I have selected one sculpture from the Bharat Stupa, which is in India, which could be dated to the 2nd century BC during the Sunga period. There, the Maya is lying down on a bed. The bed is Indian. It is not Greek. So in Gandhara, you can see a Greek bed. But in the center of India, I mean, this is the province of deep India, where you have a typical Indian bed. And also there is something else that we see in Gandhara Nath, the way the different events of the life of the Buddha are depicted. They are very like a theater. So every scene is divided into different episodes, separating by columns surmounted by pseudo-Corinthian capitals. For example, I selected this sculpture on the bottom. We have a sitter predicting that the newly born son of Maya or Ansuddhodana will be a Buddha or the universal king. And on the second one, we have the feast given to the sage. And then on the extreme left, we have Siddhartha, the Bodhisattva, going to school. Now, the way these are depicted, it's almost like theater. Even the scenes that were taken inside the house, as if the front wall is completely taken away, and we are looking at something as it, it is performed in a Greek theatre. So that's also very typical of Gandhara art, which we don't see on other forms of Indian art like Sanchi, Bharut, Andhra, and Mathura. Of course, as I told you, the story is Indian, story is Buddhist, but the gods or goddesses and also the human characters, they wear Greek dress like Keton, but they are shown as if they are like Greeks. Um, and also the ways, I mean, to depict these motifs, they selected mythical creatures. Uh, I have selected one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. If you compare it with this motif, with the half man and half sea monster from Pompeii mosaic, you can see the inspiration. It's no more in the Greek context, but it is in an Indian context, but the motifs are Hellenistic. 
Another good example that we see, especially in the Roman art, on the, for example, I am taken a Roman uh, sarcophagus, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the same motive, these are the garland bearers, putis, or erotos, or cupids, they are in garlands. The same motif is taken by the artist of Kandara. For example, I am showing you this stupa found in Buner, where you can see the second register from, the, from below. You have same kind of erotos or cupids carrying the garlands. So this is what we call Gandhara art. When we compare with the other forms of Indian art, they have Indian character. But the Gandhara art, which was in Gandhara region, in today's Pakistan, the north part of Pakistan, these regions were under the Greeks for a long time, more than 100 years. And also there were connections with Alexandria of Egypt and also with Parthia and Syria. So uh, the inspirations may have come from the Greek world. So they take the motives from the Greek world to narrate a story which is Indian. to this period, the Buddha had been represented in largely an abstract manner, such as the Dhamma Chakra or footprints, before taking a human form as he is often seen today. What precipitated the change in the attitude of how the Buddha is to be portrayed in art, and how much of this can we attribute to the influence of Hellenistic stylization? It's, um, it's a very interesting question because I personally believe images of anthropomorphical Buddha, I mean Buddha in human figure, were not to be seen in early form of Indian art. I am referring to Sanchi, Bharat, and Buddhaya. Only in Gandhara art, we see Buddha in human form. So we normally date the Gandhara art or the Buddha in human form to the period of Kanishka, that means from 127 of the Kuman era. So Alfred Fouché thought to depict the Buddha, but nobody knew how Buddha looked like. So they, they selected the most beautiful Greek god, which is Apollo, and convert Apollo into the Buddha. So there are many sculptures, we can see these features. I mean, of course, he had exceptional lakshana, that means qualities of a man, but they take mainly the high, what we call the Ushnesha, high perturbance in the skull, and also Urna, which is in right in the middle of the forehead. But when you look at it, he's dressed like, almost like a Greek. And also, I mean, he looks like a Greek god, Apollo, or you can see the Greek elements. Um, another seated Buddha where you can see he's also preaching there. As you said very correctly, at the beginning, for example, in Sanchi and Baharut, you know, Baharut we normally date to the second century BC. The great Sanchi Stupa is normally dated to 1st century BC. Buddha is never depicted in human form. As you correctly said, we uh, see the Buddha with, the sim with symbols, for example, the Buddha Pada, footprint of the Buddha, and also the three Ratna symbol, which is three jewels, that means the Buddha, Sangha, that means the clergy, and uh, the Dhamma, which is the law or the preaching of the Buddha. So these symbols can be seen in Sanchi. You never see Buddha. Also, there are depictions which took place or the events took place during the lifetime of the Buddha. But Buddha is always depicted uh, with symbols. There is another one where you can see Buddha, I mean, after his enlightenment, went to see his father um, and his stepmother, Mahapradhapati, and all the people of his former kingdom came to see him. So we have the Buddha in the middle, but not in human form. But he is symbolized by a seat. The artist never dared to show the Buddha in a uh, human form. And famous one also, in the, um, there is another sculpture in Great Sanchi Stupa of the South Torana. The first sermon, we know the Buddha preached in a park where there were gazelles and deer, which is called a deer park. The Buddha is not depicted in human form, but we have a chakra that you correctly call a Dharma Chakra, that means turning of the wheel, and we can see people listening to him. But if you see the same scene in Gandhara Nath, you can see Buddha preaching, and also you can see in the reliefs his disciples. In Sanchi and Bharut, even his disciples who were monks are not depicted. 
So we see all nobles, the royal personalities, but Buddha is depicted with the Dharma Chakra. So as you said very correctly, it can be an umbrella, it can be a seat, it can be a chakra, it can be the footprints of the Buddha. So the reason why it happened during the Gandharan period was for the Greeks to depict their gods was not a problem. As we know very well, even from the archaic period, Athena, Zeus, Apollo, Poseidon, they were all depicted in human form. For the Greeks who were there, to depict their, I mean, what they believe in Buddha, the, who invented the Buddhism, or the main figure of Buddhism, Sakyamuni Buddha. So they selected the uh, Greek form and gave a Greek form to Buddha. And from this moment onwards, he appears in human form. So that is the secret of Gandharana as well. Probably one of the most recognizable Greek motifs found in Indian art is the demigod Heracles, who assumes the protector role of Vajrapani, the guardian of the Buddha. It's worth noting that his characterization in Greek mythology and drama fluctuates from either being a brawny monster slayer or a body and gluttonous drunk. How did the image of Heracles translate across Central and South Asia into a protector figure in Buddhist iconography? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Vajrapani, we exactly don't know its role. Some said, well, I mean, when you see Heracles holding a, a Vajra, which is a thunderbolt, uh, he was Devadatta, who was the enemy of the god, or Mara, or Yaksha, that means a demon. Or some said he was a bodyguard. Alfred Fouché thought, I mean, Vajra uh, is a re symbolic instrument of the master's magic power. I think uh, the Fouché was absolutely correct. Why they selected Heracles? As we know very well, Alexander imitated to a certain extent Heracles because he was a mortal who became immortal, who was admitted to the Pantheon of the Greeks. Alexander considered himself because he considered himself as the son of Ammon and Zeus. And also we can see on the coinages, for example, starting from Euthydemus the first that we date from 230 to 200 BCE, who was born in Magnesia on the Meander uh, in Anatolia, where Heracles was divinized and venerated. So he shows on the reverse of his coins, Heracles seated on a pile of rocks. On the rocks, we can see the skin of the lion from Nemea and holding the club in the hand. And also quite interesting in Iconum, which is a Greek city excavated by the French archaeological delegation in Afghanistan under Paul Bernard, they found statues of Heracles and also on the coins of Euthydemus and also Demetrius, Lysias and others. And also the gymnasium of, uh, of Iconum was dedicated to Heracles. So he was venerated as a hero who became a god, a mortal who became immortal. There are very beautiful depictions of Vajrapani, for example, in Hadda, in Afghanistan, in Tepe Chateau, excavated by our African colleagues and also by uh, French colleagues where you have the Buddha seated on his right hand side, if we take the Vajra or the thunderbolt out, it is absolutely Heracles. We can see the skin of the lion around the waist and also the head of the lion on his left shoulder. And he's holding, instead of the club, the Vajra. That's the reason why we call him Vajrapani or, I mean, the spirit of the Buddha. There is only one location, this famous sculpture, which was found in Pakistan, later confiscated by the Soviet army, given to the Kabul Museum. And during the destruction of the Kabul Museum, this sculpture was stolen, which I could see, which is intact. And of, of course, the story is that the two weeks that Buddha spent after his enlightenment in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree, they are right in the middle. We have a Vajrapani who looks like Heracles because he has the club club is held with his right hand, on the left hand, he's holding a Vajra. So, so you get on one side Heracles, on the other side, the Indian story of Vajrapati. So in appearance, he's Greek, but the story is Buddhist. So that's the beauty of Gandharanar. And to answer your question, uh, they selected the hero, the best hero in the Greek mythology, who is Heracles, to show the spirit or the determination of the Buddha, who is called Vajrapani.
there exist several artistic renditions in Indian sculpture work that strongly resemble Greek Hellenistic kings, adorned of the diadem and often carrying items like grapevines, such as the reliefs of Sanshi or the so-called Barhut Yavana. In your opinion, do you think that these are intended to be the likenesses of Indo-Greeks, or Greeks in general, or do they represent something else entirely? I think you are referring to this sculpture in Bharut Stupa, I mean, which is dated to the 2nd century BC. He was identified as an Indo-Greek because of the diadems he is wearing. You can see instead of the two, there are three panels coming out of, from the diadem, but it is not a Greek dress. It looks uh, more Persian than Greek. Very difficult to say whether he was really a Greek or whether he was a Persian. He was certainly a foreigner, not an Indian, because Indians do not dress in this manner. But I would like to show a very interesting sculpture from Sanchi, the great stupa, which is in the East Torana, the rare side, where you can see I mean, a woman and a man riding goats. So if you look at the, the figure on our left-hand side, the way that his hair is depicted, or in a stylized form, he looks more like Emperor Hadrian or the indo king called Agathocles. And also the dress he is wearing, it's not Indian, it's more or less Greek. And also the shoes and the boots he is wearing, uh, they are not Indian, but Greek. But we don't know whether he was an indo Greek king. It could be just a Greek who is riding this mythical animal. They are, they are not Greek. I thought I should talk about this sculpture, which is also found in the Great Sanchi Stupa, and one of the earliest forms of Indian art. It is in the north face, north Torana, in a face of the right pillar, where you can see a group of musicians venerating a stupa. And if you look at them very carefully, they all look like Syrians. Now, for example, there is one who is playing the double flute. As we know, double flute would be Greek. And also it was borrowed by the Scythians and others, and later by Indians. And also I'm showing you the, the god of the Oxus River, which was found in Uzbekistan, where you can see a person playing the double flute. This type of wind instrument later entered into Indian knives as Kombu Pattu in Tamil. And also they wear, you know, the way that they have the Scythian, uh, almost like Phrygian caps and also double face drums, dolak, and also which of course entered in the Indian customs. So these are all, I mean, they could be Greek or the way they are dressed and also the reason why I think they are, they, I mean, at least some of them are Scythians because uh, some of them wear the Phrygian cap. So they are not really the kings, but the Greeks and Scythians during this time, I'm a few date Barut to second century BC and also Sanchi to first century BC. This was the time Greeks were ruling in Gandhara. So there were certain interactions. I'm sure there were delegations. We'll be talking about this later, I think. There were certain, to a certain extent, Greeks were visiting Mathura and Sanchi and other places in India. So they must have given money donations that their portraits are in the stupa and they, are, they could be Greeks or they could be Scythians. How did the political successors of the Indo-Greeks, namely the Indo-Saka, Indo-Parthians, and lastly the Kashans, continue to incorporate several aspects of Hellenistic imagery and designs into their art? Yes, for example, the Sakas or the Scythians, if we take the coins of Maoris, on the obverse, we can see a bigger, you know, the chariot driven by two horses. And there is a chariot here, a woman riding the chariot. The chariot could be Selene, the sister of Helios, the sun god. Although the king is Scythian, the motif is absolutely Hellenistic and Greek. And on the reverse, with the legend written in Gandhari language, uh, using Karoshti Aksharas, Karoshti letters, we have Zeus the supreme god of the Greek pantheon, seated and with a gesture. And if, all, if I also take another point of Maui's, who was the first Scythian king to rule in Gandhara, on the obverse we have Zeus seated, and to his right side we have thunderbolt. But this is a personification of the thunderbolt. In a Hindu context, it is a Vajra Purusha. A Purusha means a person, who is personifying 
the symbol of the Vajra or the Thunderbolt. As we know, Thunderbolt is the attribute par excellence of Zeus. On the reverse side, we have a person, it's almost like a Taiki, because on the head we have the towers, so it's a city goddess. So these motifs come from the Greek iconography. And also the greatest Indusidian king who ruled in the Gandhara area was Asis the first of the Asis the first. On the obverse, we have the king riding a horse, wearing heavy armor, what we call the cataphractus. And on the reverse, we have Athena Alkidabas. This was typical reverse type, first depicted on the coins of Menander, the greatest Hindu Greek king ever ruled in Indian territories, because it reminds us of Alexander, because Athena Alkidabas was the protector goddess of Pella, where Alexander was born. And if you take also, for example, Asis the second, where we can see Athena again as Pallas, and also on some coins, we can see Zeus holding Nike or on some coins Poseidon. So the Greek iconography were taken by the Indusidians and also the Indopathians. For example, Gondofaris, who was the greatest Indopathian ruler to rule in the Gandhara area. We have a portrait on the office. On the reverse, Nike holding the wreath and the palm, and of course, wing Nike, we all know, and she's the goddess of victory. On the Kushan coinage, we can see Persian or Zoroastrian gods like Nana depicted, and also the first depictions of the Buddha are on the coins of Kanishka the first, and also gods like Maitreya, and also the Hindu gods like Kartikya or Skandakumar. And also, there is a series of coins where the gods are identified, iconography is correct. For example, Helios, it is written in Greek characters, Helios. And then we have Hippaistos, we have Selene, and then Animus, Heracles, and Serapis. So the Greek gods were taken into the Kushan coinage by Kanishka, followed by Huishka and others. On Huishka's coin, we can see Huishka on the elephant back. And on the reverse, with the legend, Heracleo, I mean, referring to Heracles, he's holding the club and also the skin of the lion. There is another very interesting coin series where we can see the wing god. It is named as Animos, as all we know. Animos may refer to one of the Animoi, which are the wing gods. We don't know because there is no symbol to identify which direction, cardinal point they represent. So the Greek legend says animos, deriving from animoi in the plural form. But as we can see, he has wings and also holding some sort of a cape or some sort of mantle blown with the wind. And we also see on the points of Kanishka, the Persian or the Zoroastrian version of the wind god Oado, which inspired even the Silk Road paintings at Kizil. And also in Gandhara Nath, there's a very famous sculpture where you can see the wind god. As I mean, his mouth is open as if he's blowing the wind from his mouth. So the Greek gods entered into the coinage and also the sculptures and also the paintings of the Indusidians, Indupathians and the Kushaks. For some scholars, such as Professor A.K. Narayan, the impact of Indo-Greek rule upon the culture of India was relatively ephemeral in nature, with Narayan famously stating that, quote, the Greeks came, the Greeks saw, but India conquered. Do you believe that historians emphasize Greekness too much when looking at the art of Gandhara at the expense of the local Indian or Central Asian artistic traditions? Or was there a sense of genuine Philhellenism on the part of the local craftsmen and sponsors of these works of art? Very interesting question. A.K. Narayan was Indian and he was at the Benares Hindu University where he graduated. Later, he joined the Oriental, I mean, School of Oriental and African Studies, London University, and he obtained his PhD in 1954. So he wrote the first, I mean, I mean wonderful book, The Indo Greeks. It's quite interesting too why the attitude of A.K. Narayan, as you correctly said, 
it is opposed to the attitude of W. W. Tan, who was who did law. I mean, from the Trinity College from uh, Cambridge. And of course, for the health reason, he gave up practicing law and became an historian. I mean, he wrote a lot of books on Alexander, and also the famous book was Greeks in Bactria and India. For A.K. Narayan, like many British scholars of that time, as the British, they pretended that by colonizing India, civilized India, and they also considered Greeks civilized India. So Narayan's attitude was against the point of view of W. W. Tan and many other, not all, but many other British archaeologists and art historians and and historians. That's why he wrote, "Their history is a part of the history of India and not of the Hellenistic states." And as you said, he said they came, they saw, but India conquered. So he entitled his book "Indo Greeks" against the title of. W. W. Tan, Greek in Bactria and India. So we have to think. In 1947, India was liberated and became an independent country, and this was the period we can see anti-colonial attitude in India. There were two tendencies. Some completely rejected the idea that there was no Greek inspiration on Indian art. It is all India. But on the other side, some said you can see both. So in the middle of all that, I mean, I am from Sri Lanka. I looked at it in a different perspective. We can't go from one extreme to the other. We cannot deny the Greek inspiration on Indian art, at least in Gandharan region. I recently, I published a stupa which was, I mean, supposedly from Buner area. It's complete stupa with different levels. There are six registers. Below there are lotus flowers separated by columns surmounted by Corinthian capitals, and above we can see garland bearers. As I said earlier, this is a Roman and a Greek motif. Cupids and putti carrying the garlands. Above that there are major depictions of the life of the Buddha. For example, the engagement of Siddhartha with his future wife Yashodhara. Each scene separated by the columns. Surmounted by Corinthian capitals, and then there is another register where you can see the life story of the Buddha, starting from the dream of Maya until the Parinirvana and the cremation. Above that, I'll come to that in a moment. We can see Dionysian scenes, and on the top register we have the generic Buddhas and gods and people venerating them. If we look at the second register from the top, where we have Dionysian scenes. That's very clearly. It is only Greek. It can't be anything else. Where you have putties plucking grapes, then they are trampling the grapes, and then we have the fermentation, distribution of the grapes, and then people collect them into huge caters and they start drinking, and then we have flirting scenes. So this is, of course, all the motifs that I described so far. They were borrowed from the Greek world to tell a story which is Indian. So, if you look at it on both sides, for example, this stupa depicts what we call the stratification of the world, what we call in the Chakraval cosmology. On the top of it, we have the sky depicted by the devas, and the middle region with Gandharvas and Yakshas, and then the earth creatures or Manushyas or the human beings depicted by the life story of the Buddha, and then we have the Urga and Naga, that means snakes. Uh, the crawling earth creatures depicted by the garland bearers and the subterranean creature prakshas and asuras which is the underworld so likewise in gandhara art we find a lot of motifs evoking dionysus plucking grapes making wine and drinking wine and flirting because dionysus was quite famous there are so many stories as we know from diodorus and also from euripides and others The conquest of India by Dionysus, and also there are tens and twenties of plaques were found, gold silver plates with gold emblemata in the middle depicting Dionysus and Ariande, and also in the Gandhara art, for example, we can take a sculpture. I mean, three sculptures from the Cleveland Museum, which were the parts of stairizers, where you can see drinking scenes, a couple. A man giving wine to a woman, semi-nude, drinking wine. On the other side, we can see 
somebody carrying wine in goat skin. This inspired a lot the Gandhara Nath. For example, there is a famous sculpture in the Hiryama collection where Dionysius is seated on a panther. I mean, of course, his um, vehicle or the animal par excellence held by two women because he's completely drunk. Over it, certainly there was a statue of a Buddha. And also not only Dionysius and Ariande, but also we have satire, Maynard and Pans, because we can see the horns. Usually old man with a young woman embracing or flirting, where you can see also the grapes. Another uh, relief in the Tokyo National Museum, so-called Dionysian scene, one man is drinking directly from the goat skin containing wine. And then old man, the Indian version of Dionysius, a young woman seated on his thigh and drinking wine. And also the, in the stupa that I showed at the end, we have this kind of scenes. So they took the Greek motifs to narrate a story. I mean, as Martha Carter said, I mean, I would like to quote her, within the Gandharan Buddhist context, Dionysian motifs could be understood as a, sim a symbolic representation of the intermediary world of Yakshas. Obviously, the lower heavens on the slopes of the world mountain were far more accessible even if they were only temporary way stations in the inevitable cycle of rebirth. So this is what we see. So the, the question is the attitude of Narayan to say and also the extreme nationalist tendency from Indian side saying that there are no inspirations from the Greek side. There are inspirations. They borrowed Greek motives. But to narrate the Indian story, the story of the Buddha. So that is the beauty of Kandara Nath. I mean, for example, we don't see the Dionysian scenes in Mathura art, uh, which is right in the middle of India today, and also in the Andhra Pradesh. There are di different ways of depicting Kubera, the god of wealth, but we don't see Dionysius there. The reason why we have Dionysian scenes, or even as you asked uh, earlier about Heracles, uh, that you see only in Gandhara because there were Greeks before that. I mean, there is a history from Alexander the Great until straight or the second Greeks were there. And if you look at the excavations in Afghanistan by the French archaeologist Taikano, they found a Greek city with gymnasium, Greek theatre. So these inspirations were there. Um, and we cannot deny them. So we have to think in between, as Buddha said, Madhyama Pratipada, we have to come to the middle way and see both sides without going to one extreme. While we have been overly focusing on the direction of cultural transfer from Greece to India, I think it's also important to look at it from the other side. Is there any evidence of Indian artistic motifs or mythology being adopted by the Greeks, such as the depiction of Hindu deities? There are few, not many, because the, especially the Greco-Bactrians and the Hindu Greeks who were the successors of Alexander the Great, they preferred to depict their gods like Zeus, Athena, Poseidon, Apollo, and others. In a way, they are referring to Alexander the Great as the descendants of Alexander the Great, uh, most of the gods that they selected, like Athena Alcidemus, because of the connection with Pella, where Alexander was born, and also Dionysius, because of conquest of uh, conquest of Alexander, related to the conquest of Dionysius of India, and also Heracles, mortal who became immortal. But during the excavations done by the French archaeological delegation in Iconum, they found an interesting series of coins struck by Agathocles. Agathocles in his normal adequate uh, tetradrams and drums and obols, you have the portrait of the king on the obverse, on the reverse, Zeus holding Hecat with uh, two torches in the hand with the Greek legend. But there was a series where we can see Balarama Samkarshana and Vasudeva Krishna, two gods belonging to the Bhagavata cult. They were first identified by the French uh, specialist of Hindu iconography, John Filioza. So he correctly identified the divinity holding the Musala or the pestle and Hala, the plough, as Samkarshana Balarama, and the one holding the chakra, the wheel, and the Sankha, the conch shell, as Vasudeva, the Krishna. So if you look at it very carefully, on the obverse, where you have the Greek legend Basileus Agathocleus, 
on the god facing on his left hand is holding a plow so this is the agrarian nature of balarama rama the mighty the brother of krishna these are very famous hindu gods in hindu pantheon and they resemble to the plow still used in countries like india sri lanka and burma and on the other hand he has a musala or a pestle which is according to epic puranic tradition synonymous with samkarshana the first of vishnu or bhagavad in the vihu forms so we have bhagavad a vishnu god on the obverse and also on the reverse the god is holding a chakra a wheel it's a distinctive attribute of krishna vasudeva who like samkarshana is another form of vishnu and on the right hand he holds a conch shell or the samka it is a symbol of vasudeva krishna so it's quite interesting to see that these gods were adopted by a greek king i mean in this normal coinage we can see zeus on the reverse but these gods appeared on the coins of the mayan period especially during the ashokan period where you have balaram samkarshan and was they were krishna on the panchmark coins so i'm sure you knew some of these coins where you can have a god holding the chakra and the plow so what the greek engraver he was certainly looking at a existing sculpture and the way he understood it he engraved it for example there are a lot of problems with this engraving over the head he thought this is a part of the headdress but it is not a headdress but it is a chatra a parasol that you can see over the nobles and also the gods but this is the way how the greek engraver saw the sculpture and depicted it and another story for example if you take the coins of antiochus on the obverse we have the portrait of the king on the reverse we have zeus holding nike but he is associated with elephant zeus is not associated with elephant he is associated with eagle but here we are in an indian context the irony is the oldest of the inscription related to bhagavad kalta I mean the cult of vishnu with historical implication was found in besnaga in vidisha in madhya pradesh right in the middle of india where the inscription says it was erected in honor of vasudeva the god of gods or deva deva by a greek from taxila taxashila his name is heliodorus son of dion ambassador of great king maharaja the, the great king antiochus to the local king bagabadra the savior it was in his auspicious and beyond that bhagavad worship developed in taxila and in the surrounding gandharan region during the two centuries before the common era so it's a quite interesting aspect of course the indo greeks tried to show themselves as the greek the time to time the one of the i mean the ambassador of one of the greatest indo greek kings called antiochus belonged to the bhagavata cult he was a believer of vishnu and he engraved an inscription on one of the columns and also the depiction of balaram samkarshan and vasudeva krishna and also on some coins we can see lakshmi the hindu god in the goddess of prosperity although there aren't many but there are occasions where the greeks borrowed the hindu gods on their coinages i think this is an excellent place to conclude our discussion and i would just like to say thank you once again for taking the time to speak for my listeners about such an incredibly fascinating topic Now do you have any current upcoming projects or books in the works or any websites or links you'd like me to share for my audience Oh there are uh, several things I mean recently as you correctly said in the introduction I wrote this book when west met east gandhara not revisited which is a two volume a book and also a new book came up uh, which is called the greek god helios and the indian deity surya it is on the sun god looking at the depiction of sun god surya in india and also helios on the greek context and also mitra in a zoroastrian or mitraic context uh, and also the paintings coins and the sculptures recently i published a book with my colleague sushmita basu majuddar uh, several hoards very important hoard was found in barikot uh, containing panchmark coins and also the indo greek coins the i mean and these are the main books which came out last year 2021 and this year 2022 um, at present i am working of my first book which is the corpus 
a catalog of the Bactrian and the indo kings, which I am doing now with one of my former students, Olivier Bordeaux, and hopefully we'll be able to finish the book before summer. And by the end of the year, it will be published uh, with color photographs and it will be written in English. My first book was in French and it will be written in English. And there are many other projects of I'm um, continue to work on Gandharana. I think it is fascinating. There is a website where I update uh, all my activities connected with India, or Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. And I would, I would like to thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. And also, thank you very much for interesting questions you asked. I hope I answered you correctly. Um, I mean, it needs more time to even to think and rethink. The questions are absolutely interesting. I think I tried my best to positive answers uh, to your question, Derek. I'm very, very thankful to you. As per usual, I will make sure to provide all these links in the podcast description and in my website, including with any show notes that I usually have. In the meanwhile, thank you all for joining us, and you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>